In hidden corners of the world, governments are testing unidentified flying objects. But are they of extraterrestrial origin? This is indeed an unidentified flying object. Are classified radical aircraft designs responsible for many UFO sightings? It may be the biggest story in history. Does the American government possess nine alien spacecraft? Potentially, a person seeing one of these aircraft could think that it wasn't an aircraft, it was a spaceship. Is it test flying them to reveal the secrets of interstellar travel? Repetitive pulsing, booming noise, like somebody unzipping the sky. But beware, not all is as it seems. What is the truth? Discovery's cameras will show you a base that does not exist officially. Everybody loves a base that doesn't exist. Aircraft that don't exist. All we can really say is it was traveling faster than the speed of sound. And a man who says he worked for the US government involving nine flying saucers or flying disks all together. With us, enter the deep black world that is dreamland. Aircraft are often confused with UFOs. I've seen it before, you've had UFO enthusiasts and stealth watchers in the same area. And when they see a light, someone who is an enthusiast and knows what aircraft look like automatically says, oh, well, look, it's a B-1 bomber. But for a, someone who is a UFO enthusiast and wants to see a UFO, that light automatically becomes the mothership. In 1992, Steve Douglas was filming military air exercises at Roswell, New Mexico. In the near dark, his camera caught a few seconds of a very strange triangular craft. He took the fuzzy picture to an expert. This is probably your proverbial tantalizing image because it is something we believe is, is an unusual aircraft, one that the government doesn't admit they have, so it would be exciting to be able to get a good, clear picture of it because this is just interesting. It's, 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 it's exciting. It's exciting to discover something unknown. I mean, this is a black aircraft against a black sky, and there's a lot of noise in the frame so that anytime you look at the aircraft, it's almost the same color as the background. This is a, a cleaned up, processed image that I did using, if you would, pure image processing. But that's still awfully noisy, and it's very hard to see anything. But it would be very easy to use a computer to help clean it up, to go in and electronically you know, look at the image and say, wow, that's, that's the sky, and that's noisy, and here are the edges of the object, and I'll just clean them up. I'll smooth out those edges. Well, the problem with that is if I have expectations about what I'm going to see, and I use those in the work I'm doing, then what I end up getting is exactly what I was looking for. I can make it anything I want, a flying saucer or you name it. It, it is obviously flying, it's obviously unknown, so it is definitely a UFO, but that doesn't mean it's a spaceship from another planet or a time traveler or a fill in the blank. We have strong suspicions that this is in fact a highly secret, highly stealthy reconnaissance airplane that the government has and has operated, but for reasons of security, they haven't admitted that they own or operate it. This is indeed a, an unidentified flying object. This is what Steve Douglas filmed, the TR-3 Black Manta. It does not exist officially. Is the Black Manta sighting a one-off? In the last five years, the description of UFOs has changed. Reports of triangular craft are as common as traditional saucer shapes. Last year, a British Airways flight from Milan descended to land at Manchester, England. Suddenly, a triangular craft flashed past the airliner just yards in front of its nose. Neither the airliners nor ground control's radar detected the high-speed craft. It was a classic close encounter. But with what? Newspaper headlines screamed that an alien spacecraft had buzzed the jetliner. 
What they did not report was what specialist aviation magazines already knew. Less than 15 miles away, a British company is building the top secret prototype of a stealth aircraft. It has a strange triangular shape. It is an unidentified flying object, a UFO. Strange aircraft are often reported in the press. Some become famous, others never make it beyond the prototype. They are UFOs. They do not exist, officially. And fly from a base that does not exist, officially. The home of America's deep black aircraft is hidden in the Nevada nuclear test site. For decades, nuclear warheads were tested here. It's not a safe place for the unwary to venture. Las Vegas is nearby, but the tourists play unaware of the black world hidden over the horizon. Area 51 of the test site is Groom Lake. Aircraft call sign, Dreamland. Groom Lake appears in no list of military installations. And yet, it has the longest runway in the world and the biggest aircraft hangar. What it holds is above top secret. Dreamland does not exist officially. And yet, it has attracted so much public attention that maps of the base are now available. To enter here means risking imprisonment without trial. The use of lethal force is authorized. It was from Groom Lake that the great spy planes of the Cold War were operated in complete secrecy. The U-2, the CIA's spy plane, was first flown here. Later, the family of aircraft that include the SR-71 Blackbird lived in top secrecy for more than 10 years. The Blackbird flew faster and higher than any aircraft. Like the U-2, it was invulnerable until missile technology made it obsolete. Unknown to the general public, the stealth fighter was tested here. Top secret aircraft have been confused with UFOs for half a century. In the mid and late 40s, it was a period of fantastic development in aviation. Today we can't appreciate it, but there were airplanes without propellers. That was akin to a car without a motor. There were airplanes without tails. There were airplanes that were disc-shaped. There were airplanes with swept wings. Potentially, a person seeing one of these aircraft could think that it wasn't an aircraft, it was a spaceship. A person not knowing about these aircraft would think that there's something beyond earthly performance and assume that these were, in fact, flying saucers. The world's first reported sighting of flying saucers was, in fact, of flying wings. Pilot Kenneth Arnold saw delta-winged craft, not disks. After he made the sighting and landed, Kenneth Arnold talked with several other pilots and their idea was that it was some type of U.S. secret weapon, a guided missile, or it had been built by the Soviets. Later, the idea came up that these were not earthly vehicles, but alien vehicles, based on their performance and maneuvers, which could not be matched, reportedly, by any earthly materials, or um, they could not be survived by the human body. The U.S. government did make an attempt to build a flying saucer. The Avro car was probably the best lawnmower ever built. The pilot had to wear an oxygen mask to keep from choking on the grass clippings. It was essentially a hovercraft. It was only a technological demonstrator for a whole family of very remarkable aircraft. The Lockheed Skunk Works, California. Generations of deep black aircraft were built here. 
In recent years, its parking lot has remained full. Yet officially, it has little work underway. Too little to explain all the activity. Production of the Blackbird spy plane is long finished. Its last contract was for the stealth fighter. That is near completion. It cannot explain the work being done behind closed doors. Is a new deep black triangular UFO being built? Aviation experts suspect that the answer lies in a 1985 Pentagon document. A mysterious aircraft codenamed Aurora Project was accidentally included alongside budgets for the U-2 and Blackbird spy planes. There has been no mention of it since. It does not exist, officially. The first thing I heard about Aurora was that air traffic controllers out on the west coast were being told to expect very high-speed targets on their radar screens, um, that it was a classified program, um, that they weren't to panic and they weren't to report it to anybody else. The next piece of information, and the one that I think really started me investigating the Aurora story, was a sequence of sonic booms over California. On Thursday, June the 18th, 1992, at 7 in the morning, and on six other Thursdays at the same hour in the preceding year, a minor tremor rattled coffee cups in Los Angeles. Spurred on by telephone calls from worried residents, Jim Morrie of the US Geological Survey set out to discover what was causing this unusually punctual earthquake. At his disposal is a network of seismic recording stations. He quickly established that it was a double sonic boom from a supersonic aircraft. Morrie compared the signature of the aircraft's sonic boom with the patterns produced by those of the space shuttle landing outside Los Angeles and by the SR-71 Blackbird on its world speed record transcontinental flight in 1991. It was completely different. The size and spread of the boom is unique. We actually have quite a few sonic booms in Southern California. One of the reasons is that the space shuttle lands at Edwards Air Force Base, which is in the desert here. It's possible to tell the direction, the speed, and the height of the object that's producing the sonic boom if you have good instrumental recording. So for these mystery booms that we saw, it's clear that they are flying um, offshore. Um, because we don't have any stations there, we don't have very much data, so we really couldn't get an accurate estimate of how fast that particular object was traveling. All we can really say is it was traveling faster than the speed of sound. And one other possibility is that it could be meteorites, and there are instances of meteorites producing similar booms. Obviously, though, a meteorite happening every Thursday morning seems a little unlikely. The breakthrough came when Bill Sweetman received an eyewitness drawing of what could only be the aurora. I had written a couple of Aurora stories suggesting that the evidence was accumulating that something was out there. And I received in the mail a sketch and a note from a man named Chris Gibson. This eyewitness is one of the best in the business. Chris Gibson was a member of Britain's Royal Observer Corps. He was part of their elite international recognition team, one of the top military aircraft observers in the world. One day in 1989, whilst working on an oil rig in the North Sea, a colleague called Chris outside. There was a formation of four aircraft. The lead aircraft was a KC-135 Stratotanker, and off its port side were two F-111 fighter bombers. Off the tail of the KC-135 Stratotanker was a black triangular aircraft. It had no, no wings, no tail, a perfect triangle, and uh, there's nothing that I've ever seen before looked like that, which uh, was an unusual occurrence because uh, I'm trained in instant recognition by the Royal Observer Corps, and uh, if I didn't know what it was, it's not in any books. This shape and the sonic booms told Bill Sweetman a great deal. If you're looking at an aircraft that is designed to fly at what's loosely called hypersonic speeds, that's five or six times the speed of sound or upwards, there are several things that become absolutely essential. Uh, one is that uh, you require a very high degree of sweep back on the wing leading edges. Otherwise, you start getting into severe problems of drag 
and aerodynamic heating. As you go into this very slender shape, you still need to have a lot of volume in that shape for fuel, um, for propulsion, for true. And the best way to provide that is to blend the wing and the body together. You get a very characteristic, um, highly blended triangular shape, um, which is, in plan view, identical to what Chris saw. Photographic evidence came from Amarillo, Texas, home to a sophisticated military signals monitoring post. March, I think it was March 23rd, 1992. I was back here in my office when the house was shook by what sounded like a large sonic boom. I'd heard a lot of, a lot of sonic boom before, so I know they, how they sound, but this one seemed to continue it wasn't just a, a crack boom and left. It was a rather large shutter that you could feel in your chest and the windows vibrated. And that's when I saw this very high speed aircraft flying over the house at incredible rate. Um, I grabbed my camera knowing it was something, something uh, different, especially because of the way the contrail worked. The donuts on a rope contrail is produced by no conventional aircraft. Its engine noise is also unique. It's a deep, thrumming, regular pulsing, booming noise, like somebody unzipping the sky. You feel it more in your chest than you hear it. It doesn't sound like a jazz. It doesn't sound like a rocket. It's just very unique and uh, an amazing sound. The donuts on a rope contrail has been reported from around the world. This never-before-seen footage was taken by an amateur cameraman from a transatlantic passenger jet. It's very hard to hide an aircraft like the Aurora. The contrail and engine noise are the signature of a pulsed detonation engine, the kind of engine necessary to fly at hypersonic speeds. With a cruising speed of 5,300 miles per hour, Mach 8, Operating in near orbit at an altitude of 50 to 80 miles, the Aurora could reach anywhere in the world in three hours. The Aurora is a continuing investigation which is not yet closed. Personally, I think that there's overwhelming evidence that there is a high-speed program out there. Like the deep black projects that came before it, the Aurora's existence is still denied. However, anyone can fly alongside it on a computer game. The Aurora's main test base would be Dreamland at Groom Lake, Area 51 in the Nevada nuclear test site. But something hidden even deeper in the deep black world is rumored to be flown at Area 51, captured alien spacecraft. Dreamland has become the focus of those who say that there is a government conspiracy to cover up alien contact. It could be the biggest story in history. From a distant mountain top, one man keeps a vigil over Dreamland. I'm up here on Tickapoo Peak, 25 miles east of the base. It's an 8,000 foot peak. Uh, it's the last outpost of public oversight over this government facility. I come here uh, just because I need, think it needs to be done. Someone has to watch what's going on out there. And there's a lot of adventure in it, too. Everybody loves a base that doesn't exist, and, and I'm no exception. It's like they put that base out here just so I can crack it. 
I want to know what's going on in there. But more importantly, I, I like the process of cracking a mystery. This is like a Sherlock Holmes mystery. What is going on out there? You have all sorts of clues, but, but how do you put them together? The base itself, it just sits there. It's like any other Air Force base. I, I see it like a Rorschach ink blot test. People come and see this ambiguous stimulus and they impress whatever they want on the stimulus. Some people see conspiracies. They say that the one world government is, is based out there. Some other people think all the missing children in the world have been taken here. Other people see only black programs. Others see uh, spirits. They think that, that out there the aliens are communing in some way with, uh, with our government and you can send out your love and bring them into you. Uh, the, the, the stories are as varied as the people who come here. These beliefs are based on the claims of one man. There were nine flying saucers or flying disks altogether. Rachel, Nevada, population 101 and falling. Its inhabitants have seen many strange things flying over the mountains above Dreamland. I believe that there are saucer-shaped craft here on Earth. I definitely believe it was a saucer. I've seen a lot of strange things out here. It was just a series of lights. Dancing lights. And they came up close, and then they were gone in an instant. Saucers or extraterrestrial craft could be visiting the Earth. I definitely think aliens have had to have visited the Earth. Some may be extraterrestrial from another planetary system around another star. It was something from outer space. I believe it's possible. It could be within uh, regions underneath the Earth that have been established as a base. There's too much technology out here that can't be explained. We might be dealing with an interdimensional phenomenon. I definitely think the government knows. I don't think we're alone in the universe. Beyond Groom Lake is Papoose Lake, Area S4, alleged home of a flying saucer base. Bob Lazar, jet car builder, former employee of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, the birthplace of the atomic bomb, and supposedly hired as an engineer on a top secret project. I was under the impression I was going to be working on an advanced propulsion system, which was right up my alley, and I was very excited about it. And I was, I was led to believe it was going to be some sort of field propulsion system, which, in fact, it was, but I had no idea of the uh, <laughs> implications of what they were talking about. Lazar says he was flown from Las Vegas to Groom Lake, put on a bus, and driven to Area S4, Papoose Lake. We drove up, the hangar door was open, and there was a flying saucer. I got out and was led purposely through it, and I was told to keep my eyes forward and walk straight, and it was kind of a mental torture because it was a fantastically interesting thing here, but I was under the impression that this was something that we had developed, and in fact, I remember even laughing to myself that this answers all the ridiculous UFO sightings. We've been making these things all along, test flying them, and everyone's been thinking they're flying saucers from another planet, and I thought, wow, this is, this is great. In fact, they even had a little American flag stuck on the side of it, which I thought was a nice touch. Bob soon discovered that the saucer was of alien origin. It was still some time later that I was actually let inside it, and it became extremely obvious that this was something we didn't make, because only then, after seeing how small everything was inside, that it was obviously never made to, to hold a, a human. basically came clean with what we're doing is back engineering this because we want to find out how it was made. And that pretty much says <laughs> it wasn't made here. The disc itself was in three levels. The upper level, which I never got to go on. The middle one where you enter, and then there's a lower one where the gravity amplifiers hang down and you can have access to the bottom part of the craft. It's a very eerie feeling to be in there. Um, there are no obvious control panels or switches. The only thing sticking up out of the ground were three chairs, uh, the reactor itself, and the actual gravity amplifiers. And 
underneath them were the other components to the propulsion system, but that's about all that was in there. Bob Lazar has been investigated by a reporter at the local TV station. What some have called the Cosmic Watergate. There had been stories about Dreamland floating around in Nevada for a number of years, little bits and pieces in the newspaper, references to secret programs, occasionally a reference to alien technology. There have been some of those same kind of references in ufological circles, people saying, there's a secret base in Nevada, you better check this kind of a thing out. Uh, it wasn't until about 1987 I started digging into some of these things. In 1989, I met Robert Lazar, and, uh, and the story he told me was an incredible one by any standards. I thought that if, in fact, any of this stuff checks out, it may be the biggest story in history. Does Lazar's story check out? Do any records of Lazar's past employment exist? For myself and the TV station, the, the key to his credibility, the key to his story, was always Los Alamos. Because if he worked at Los Alamos, if he worked in classified projects, it is at least conceivable that he would have been brought to Nevada to work in other classified projects. As a test on his uh, veracity, we wanted to go to Los Alamos and, and have him show us around. He said, I can get you in. I said, yeah, we'll believe this when we see it. So we were there on a weekend. Fewer people are in the lab, and, and Bob, in fact, did take us in. And it was like uh, following him through this labyrinth of uh, different labs and facilities, and he knew his way around like, like a rabbit in its own burrow. He knew where everything was, and, and, uh, and that impressed me, because how would he know if he hadn't been there? Los Alamos was uncooperative from the first day. Years and years went by, and I still couldn't get any confirmation from them that Bob had ever worked there. It makes no sense. They'd have no records on someone who worked there just a few years before, but that's what they were telling me. Now, I had interviewed other people that worked with Bob there who say that he was an employee, he was a physicist, and he worked in classified projects. If that were the case, where are the records? Because to this day, we still can't find them. What this tells me is that someone has tried to wipe out Bob's background so that fewer people will give him any credibility. Lazar's first few days at the secret base were spent reading briefing documents whilst under guard. These made clear that the government possessed detailed knowledge of the aliens. It was clear that the spacecraft was not a recent acquisition. It, it seemed like they had been working on it for at least a couple of years, but it could have been 20 for all I know. Once when I went in the hangar, all the bay doors were open all the way down and you can see that there were other crafts in there and they were all completely different. Now I was told that all the power sources and propulsion systems were identical in them. As far as how many of them were operational, I only know the one that I worked on was operational. The rest of them, for, uh, for all I know, could have been cardboard mock-ups, so I really can't even comment on them. One of the crafts looked like it had been stood up on end and a projectile fired through it. Uh, so I would imagine some of these crafts were non-functional. There were nine flying saucers or flying disks all together. George Knapp persuaded his TV station to put Bob Lazar through a polygraph test, a lie detector. Did you knowingly lie when you said you had actually seen anti-gravity propulsion in operation? No. Four separate tests were performed by two different investigators. The results were inconclusive. Lazar passed two and failed to. One of the investigators is still shaken by what he heard. I was looking for all the little sign, the body language, if you will. There was tremendously positive eye contact. There was no fidgeting around, and uh, he never deviated. We covered it several different ways. I asked the same question several different ways, and his answers were always the same. Hooking him up, going through the test, then started the emotional roller coaster that I experienced that night. And it's something that uh, I can honestly say has changed my whole outlook on things. We started the first test, and it went exactly the way I thought it might. He was not doing well. 
He was uh, reacting uh, to the relevant questions more than he was to the control type of questions, which is indicative of a person who is deceptive because it's showing an emotion that he does not feel comfortable with his answers. These questions bother him. It was basically, uh, have you ever observed a saucer-shaped craft fly out at Area 51? And that was asked, uh, I think, two or three different times. Uh, the second chart we ran was on another question that dealing with uh, the gravity amplifier or an antimatter reactor as part of the powertrain. Uh, about halfway through that test, I'm looking down and all of a sudden the realization sets in that I'm looking at a probable, truthful uh, result. And I mean, I'm getting chills right now talking about it because that's what I got. Bob Lazar appeared to be truthful when he described how the craft's reactor functioned. We weren't precisely sure how everything worked, but we had a rough idea. Starting from the reactor, it reacted and extremely heavy element but stable that isn't found on Earth and we placed it on the periodic chart as element 115. This provided the basic gravity wave and electrical power to run the craft. The gravity amplifiers that were located in the craft amplified that wave and it was phase shifted, in other words, put out of sync and that was expelled from the bottom of the craft. And the Earth and all matter puts out its own gravity wave, and this put out a wave that was an opposite to it and caused lift. In other words, it wasn't squirting out fire, exhaust, compressed air, or anything that we would imagine would propel something. It was a field propulsion system. It was um, something you really couldn't sense, but would lift the craft. Field propulsion can be demonstrated with two magnets. Set one way, the magnet's poles will attract. Set the other way, the magnets will repel each other. Lazar says that the craft used gravity waves to repel and attract through space. Using earthly materials and state-of-the-art technology, we could not possibly duplicate one of these systems. Not even close. What we're seeing was a, a, a total annihilation reactor, a reactor that reacted matter and antimatter, which is something we really haven't even touched on. We know this is possible. Uh, we know we have fission reactors. We're currently trying to develop fusion reactors that produce energy like the sun does, but uh, we haven't even thought about working on antimatter reactors, which is 100% uh, efficient. And here was a working model of it, not just a working model of it, but it was small. It was something that a person could lift. And we're looking at something that you can hold in your hand and puts out more power than our full-size nuclear power plants. So this wasn't just a little bit advanced from our technology. This was, this was something big. Did Bob Lazar work out at Area 51? There is no hard evidence. Is Bob Lazar a qualified scientist? Is what he says in interviews accurate? Lie detector tests were inconclusive. An investigation by one man, Tom Mahood, an engineer from California, found flaw after flaw in Lazar's statements. But at first, he found Lazar convincing. About three years ago, I um, hooked up with the internet. I started exploring and I came across Bob Lazar's story. And uh, I really found it fascinating. He, the way he told his story seemed to ring of truth. And there were a lot of little details that he uh, uh, had on his stories that I found just utterly fascinating. It kind of captivated me. There was a couple times I woke up in the middle of the night disturbed. I, mean, I really believed that story. It seemed that credible to me. The uh, first thing that started kicking things off for me was that I don't live that far from Caltech, and Lazar claimed as part of his story that he had attended Caltech and had, um, had his records erased. I thought, well, this is an interesting uh, possibility for me to look into it and see if I could find any trace of Lazar at Caltech. And I thought the easiest thing to do to check on him was just to go through all the Caltech annuals for about a 10-year period, and I literally went through every page uh, looking for a picture or a reference to Bob Lazar. 
Now, it could be that he might be erased from the school records, but it's unlikely somebody's actually going to come in and replace a, a college yearbook. So um, I went through it and didn't turn anything up. And at that point, I'm starting to think, well, maybe he does have a degree in physics, but it, for some reason, he doesn't want people to know where it's from, and then he's just concocted a Caltech story. So I started having a few doubts at that time, but it still seemed like a fairly credible story to me. Lazar claims a university education, but gives no hard evidence. Bob wouldn't be the first person in the history to lie about his education in order to get a job. But the only records that he went to school anywhere is one electronics course at a junior college. And it doesn't make sense that someone with that level of education would get hired to work at the places where he worked, Fairchild Industries in a highly technical position, and later Los Alamos in a highly technical position. He had to get educated somewhere. If you've been to his house, if you see what he does with computers, you know he's a, as an intelligent and educated man. Where did that education come from? I look at, for example, MIT, and although Bob can't come up with any names of professors, he can't come up with any names of students, I ask myself, would a school, could a school like MIT wipe out his records? Well, I don't know. I mean, they get tens of millions of dollars a year in defense contracts. They've worked with the CIA in the past on this very UFO question. Could they do it? Would they do it? I think it's possible. Bob says that he was sacked after he made a blatant breach of security. The craft that I worked on was tested quite often. Um, it, most of the tests occurred on Wednesday nights. Uh, they were never taken out of the atmosphere. They were barely taken over the mountain range. You have to look at the fact that this was their prized possession that they were just learning how to use, and uh, they weren't about to lose it. I had the timetables for the specific testing dates and times. And I did bring some friends on a specific day where I wouldn't be working, and they got to view some of the tests for themselves. It's just sitting there. Lazar claims that they saw a bright, brilliant light. It was the alien spacecraft moving through the sky in directions and angles beyond the performance of conventional aircraft. Holy, my heart is pounding. Look at that. Is that beautiful? Is it beautiful? Now, we weren't in the base. We were still 10 miles away from it. But even out at that far, there was still a reasonable amount of security. And uh, we were able to see quite a few things. And uh, as time went on, we became lax and eventually got caught. The day after I was caught, I was supposed to show up for work. However, they had me debriefed at uh, an Air Force base north of Las Vegas. That's where a lot of the friction began between myself and the people there. They uh, pointed weapons at me, yelling in my face at a close distance, saying they were as angry as you could be without hurting someone. They threatened my life at the time they threatened my wife's life, past employment records, places I've been, places I've worked, people I had worked with. All this information began to disappear, and I actually began to be concerned that perhaps they were going to do the same to me. I thought it became necessary to see one of the people on a local news station because I thought if it went on the news, they couldn't make me completely disappear. It would look very suspicious if all of a sudden this person, you know, released these claims and then he disappeared himself. So that was that was kind of an insurance policy for me. Well, there's several, uh, actually nine. Uh, flying saucers, flying disks, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. After Lazar broke the story on the spacecraft, he was arrested and charged with pandering, helping to run a brothel in Las Vegas. When Bob came and told me that he was involved on the outskirts of this illegal brothel operation, I saw my professional life flash before my eyes. I was very upset. I had uh, written and developed a computer system so a local brothel could run efficiently in town, and uh, that is, in effect, against the law. No one had been prosecuted for that since the 1800s in Nevada. In fact, this was the first case since then, and strange for a little case like that, that there'd be FBI personnel and things like that at the hearing. So was there a push on to uh, 
create a, a lot more furor than necessary, sure, I'm positive. But they looked at that as something to discredit me. What Lazar omits to say was that he was tapping into the state vehicle registration database, looking for undercover cops. He should not be so surprised that the police wanted to prosecute with utmost vigor. We all know smart people who've done stupid things. If Einstein were arrested for drunk driving, I don't think it would reflect negatively on the theory of relativity. But Bob is, by nature, a rebel and a loner. He's got a pirate skull and crossbones flag on his house. He likes machine guns. He races jet cars. He builds outlaw firework shows. He does things out of the mainstream, and this, that's the sort of thing that would appeal to him. That doesn't mean he's not a scientist. It doesn't mean he didn't work at some of the places where he said he worked. I suspect that, you know, people, some people are never going to believe him one way or another. The difficulty you're, you're in is, how do you prove a negative? If he didn't work there, you can't prove it for sure, ever. If he did work there, the way to prove it is the kind of records that are either non-existent anymore or at least not accessible to people like myself. Bob Lazar seems to have a very peculiar memory. Um, I'm not sure that it's suspicious, but it is peculiar in that he seems to remember uh, very tiny details of his time spent at S4, yet he seems to have trouble remembering classes that he took, professors' names, dates. Uh, a lot of his past seems to be uh, faded from his memory, but not S4. On paper, I think Bob Lazar comes across as a complete fraud. Yet, I've talked to enough people and I know enough stories about things that have gone on in Area 51 that my gut feeling is that the guy was there. Whether things happened precisely as he said, I can't be sure. Should we believe Lazar's story, Tom Mahood has discovered that he did work at Los Alamos, but only for a civilian subcontractor. He was not a research scientist. He was a junior technician working on open civilian projects. Bob Lazar has been caught out, lying about his past. Until we have some hard evidence, perhaps we should recall what Einstein said. Whoever is careless with the truth in small matters cannot be trusted in important affairs. I believe the operation moved a short time after I went forward with it, uh, possibly in 90 or 91. Where they are now, your guess is as good as mine. What can we trust? There are great cases. The fabric of the craft was a, a very smooth, uh, black, glass type. There are convincing eyewitnesses. Yep, wasn't it? it was a UFO. Is there any hard data? There is one new fascinating report. On May the 5th, 1984, an alert was triggered at the North American Air Defense Command. Moving hot and fast through Earth orbit, it was not an incoming missile. It was codenamed Fast Walker. Floating in Earth orbit are the satellites operated by the US Defense Support Program. Their job is to provide the first warning of an incoming ballistic missile attack on the United States. The satellite sensors are so delicate that they also pick up infrared heat signals, even ones from minor house fires. At 1400 hours Zulu time, a DSP satellite detected a hot, fast, solid object swept in from outer space. It passed within 15 miles of the satellite and then curved back out into deep space. It was tracked for nine minutes. A top secret summary of the fast walker shows the time and place of the incident, the infrared signature of the object, and its track through Earth orbit. It was leaked to a UFO investigator. Where it appeared in the sensor field would indicate that the object came into the sensor field from outer space, went in front of the sensor, and left, departing back into deep space. It would indicate that it was some type of craft that had the ability to maneuver. If this fast walker was a meteorite, 
then the Earth's gravitational field would have sucked it into the atmosphere, burning it up. It takes energy to break the grip of Earth's gravity. Inanimate objects like meteors or space junk can't do this. Spacecraft like the Space Shuttle can. But the fast walker came from outer space. And there you have, you have hard evidence. You have telemetry from that satellite. You have information. You have systems. You have data that you can, can go back and investigate and check and verify. In the past, you easily UFO events or just eyewitness testimony. There you have a very sensitive defense system that sent you the information to the ground. I don't even know if you can solve it. Maybe it's one of those enigmas that's just going to be with us forever. You know, what type of craft would have that ability? Some people might say a UFO. Is anyone out there? An astronomer has estimated the number of civilizations likely to have existed in the universe. You take the rate of star formation in a galaxy and the fraction of stars with planets. Estimate the proportion of planets which could support life. Calculate the fraction of living things which become civilizations. Work out how long before those civilizations become detectable. Guess how long a civilization lasts. Don't forget that some civilizations can be short lived. Multiply all those figures by the number of galaxies in the universe, and you get one hundred million million.